welcome back to the Friday Show. I'm Ray Pollack, uh, joined by Editor-in-Chief Natalie Voss. We're brought to you by Woodbine. We appreciate their sponsorship throughout the year. Big weekend of racing ahead at Woodbine. And uh, without further ado, I wanted to get into our uh, guest this week, Dr. Ryan Carpenter, a surgeon, veterinarian surgeon in Southern California, uh, who last Saturday did surgery on Echo Zulu, who unfortunately had a a uh, fairly major injury while training at Santa Anita. Uh, welcome to the Friday show, Dr. Carpenter. Thanks for joining us. Yes, thanks for having me. Um, we're, as we speak, it's Thursday. What is the prognosis right now? How is she, how is uh, Echo Zulu come out of her surgery and how's so she doing? The surgery was performed on Saturday and she did great. She laid there for about an hour and a half before she stood up, got up very smoothly. Uh, we had her back in her stall shortly thereafter. And really the last several days, she's just been a model patient. She takes care of herself, lays down, gets up, moves around the stall comfortably. So very happy with what we're seeing so far. Um, she is in a cast, and so we can't physically see her leg um, or the surgery site. And we usually change the cast somewhere around about a week after surgery. Um, that's usually when the majority of the swelling has kind of come down and subsided from the injury and then from the surgery. And then we'll replace her in a cast um, that'll be a standing bandage cast, which is a little bit better um, angulation for her leg. And it's at that time where we get a good look of you know, what the blood supply to her foot looks like, how does the incision look like, and that's kind of our next big hurdle. So everything that she's done so far has been very um, positive. Um, and so we just, like we've said before, we just take it one day at a time. I, I know you said the next four to six weeks are, are critical, but it, what is the best case prognosis for her as far as a second career possibly breeding or, or anything else yeah so my dream for her is that one day you'll see her running around in a pasture in kentucky with the foal on her side and then we get to see her babies uh perform on the racetrack that would be a dream come true for all of us and i think that's what we're shooting for it's a realistic goal um we have like we said a lot of hurdles that we have to get over in the coming weeks, but she's done the first couple beautifully. And so hopefully we can continue on that path. Um, it was widely reported that, you know, when the first sort of tweets came out about the injury, the the phrase that went around was biaxial sesamoid fracture. And it occurs to me that um, some of our <clears throat> viewers may not immediately know what that means in layman's terms. So can you explain that to us a little bit? Yeah, so if you look at the fetlock joint of a racehorse, it's commonly for, referred to as the ankle. Uh, you got the cannon bone on the top, the pastern bone on the bottom, and then you got these two little bones in the back of the fetlock or the ankle called sesamoid bones. And they're very small. They're about the size of a walnut. And there's two of them. And what's important about those sesamoid bones is there's soft tissue ligament called the suspensory that inserts on the top of the sesamoid bone and then at the bottom. And they need that in order to be able to stand um, upright. If you disrupt the suspensory apparatus, whether it's tearing the suspensory branch or ligament completely or breaking a sesamoid bone, then their fetlock essentially drops to the ground. And so that's why we do the surgery to basically provide the support that the suspensory apparatus can't do anymore based on the fracture. And so when we talk about biaxial, that just means both. Um, otherwise, it would be referred to as a medial or lateral sesamoid bone fracture. Um, but when you talk about biaxial, that means both sesamoid bones are involved. Gotcha. And I, I guess you've probably already sort of explained this, but I, it seems like sesamoid injuries are particularly sort of challenging to fix and can be a little bit more kind of risky um, just generally. Is that because of that? soft tissue being right there and, you know, being so instrumental in the function of those bones? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of uh, stress and strain that takes place um, on the sesamoid bone. The other problematic thing for us as, um, as veterinarians and as surgeons is the sesamoid bone doesn't have great blood supply. There's no periosteum like other bones have. So these bones are very um, difficult to um, get to heal. And, you know, when you talk about pre-existing calluses and these things that are picked up in other locations, they don't really have the ability to do that. And so that's where it makes diagnosing these injuries very difficult without advanced diagnostics like PET scans. 
but that sesamoid bone is is critically important in um, the normal anatomy and function of the horse, but extremely difficult to deal with from a, a surgeon or veterinarian's perspective. So you've been doing these surgeries for at least a couple of years, a few years, the way that, that using this particular technique. Can you kind of take us through and explain exactly what the process is in the surgery? Yeah, so uh, we make an incision um, down the front of the cannon bone, and then we actually will completely open up the fetlock joint. So you will see the bottom of the cannon bone, top of P1, and the sesamoid bones. And we use curettes um, that look like little ice cream scoops to literally remove all the cartilage from uh, the bones that are involved in the fetlock joint. And we do this because we want to create a bone-on-bone -bone interface because that's what creates healing the fastest. So if cartilage was left in place, it would take a long time uh, for those joints to fuse. And that's why if you look at people with bad advanced osteoarthritis, they have really reactive joint capsules, really proliferative bone, and it just takes a long time to heal. So if we remove all that cartilage, we drill some holes to establish blood flow to that area, and then we lock it in place with screws, plates, and cables now we create a bone on bone interface we create a very stiff rigid fixation and that creates for a very comfortable patient afterwards and gives us the best chance that these um, that this injury will heal before the plates um, or screws can fail and so our biggest challenge as equine orthopedic surgeons is the moment i'm done with surgery my horse has to stand up use the leg, go back and live in the stall and be comfortable. Because if they don't, then they're going to develop support limb laminitis. And so there's always this race between getting the bone to heal and the point where the implants could potentially fail and break. And so with the advent of the locking plate and some of the new um, things that we've done with this technique, we've been able to maximize our potential for outcomes. So our results today are far better than they ever were 20 years ago. And that's really due to the advancement of orthopedic surgery in the last several years. How's it evolved for you personally? Because I think you told me that you, you kind of learned a technique when you went back East a couple of years ago. Yeah, so um, the, the pivotal point for me in my career and how I looked at these um, was uh, a story I said before, but several years ago when IRAP ran in the Pennsylvania Derby, he sustained a similar injury as this. And he was sent to New Bolton Center for surgery because um, Mr. Redden wanted to do anything possible to save this horse's life. And I, I remember getting the call. I got the call and Paul said, hey, Ryan, is there any way you can go back and, and do the surgery? And I said, well, Paul, and at that point in my career, I had done a handful, maybe like four or five. I said, Paul, he's at New Bolton. Dean Richardson is literally the best person on the planet to do this. Dean doesn't need my help. And I remember Paul saying, I know, but it'd make me feel more comfortable if you went. And so I hopped on a red eye flight, flew back to New Bolton. Um, and, and the thing that was just um, eye opening for me after doing that experience is I got Dean's attention for three hours and watched him do a fetlock arthrodesis, mm. which unless you're a surgery resident or a faculty member back there, you're not going to get that opportunity. And, and I, if you look at the way I did fetlock arthrodesis before my trip to Penn and after my trip to Penn, there's a dramatic difference um, in that. We use shorter plates, put more bend in the plate. Um, I, I've learned how to evaluate where the sesamoid bones are to know if we need to incorporate the pastern or not. And so that was just a real pivotal moment for me in my career that really set the stage for me to be more successful in my attempts at these cases. Um, and, and, you know, I'm very grateful for that. And so now fast forward, you know, 10 years later, and I've done, you know, 40 or 50 of these cases. Um, I, I, I know that I can offer my patients the best that they can get um, thanks to the opportunities that I've had. Um, you mentioned the the plates and cables and whatnot that go into uh, the horse at the time of surgery for something like this. Are those going to stay in there or do those come back out when the joint is fused? And if so, what does that all look like? Yeah, so our goal is to never have to remove any of the hardware. The only reason why we would ever remove hardware 
is if it got infected or was causing a problem. And that's very rare in the long run. Um, if you're going to have an infection problem, it's usually going to be in what we'd call the immediate post-operative period. So within the first couple weeks. And if you have that problem and you have to remove the hardware, then you have a failure because you don't have stability of your fracture anymore. Now, if for some random case, and it happens every now and then, but it's extremely uncommon, a year or two later, a, a plate gets infected, you can go back in a year or two later, remove the plate, because now the plate's really providing no stability to the, to the bones and to the leg. It's all done based on what the body has done. And so really we need that plate to last a good 12 to 14 weeks before the strength that the body can then overcome the plate um, and the stability that the plate provides. Related to the, the stability factor for uh, a pastern, I'm guessing in this case, there wasn't any um, significant damage to that suspensory ligament that keeps the, the sesamoids in place. But I know in other situations, um, when we see a fatal injury, it's very often there was a sesamoid injury, and then there was also something that happened to the ligament that's attached to those sesamoids. I'm sure people might be listening to this and thinking, well, if you can put a plate in there to stabilize the bone, why can't you just, you know, stabilize soft tissues that have been injured and, and save those horses also? So can you kind of explain that for, for people who haven't encountered that before? Yeah, so um, when you talk about a biaxial sesamoid bone fracture, generally speaking, the suspensory ligament itself is going to be relatively normal, but it's the bone that's the problem. So you would need to reestablish the bone in order to reestablish the suspensory apparatus. Now, if you had a mid-body sesamoid bone fracture that was nice, clean, two good pieces on either side, you can put a screw in those and essentially reestablish the um, the sesamoid bone and therefore preserve the integrity of the suspensory apparatus. In these cases, because they are so much energy and so much trauma, the bone is in multiple pieces. So I don't have the ability to anchor two pieces of bone back together because that would always be the preferred method. So now I've got to go to this technique, which basically is, is the best we got because we don't have any substantial amount of bone to work with when we're talking about the sesamoid bone fractures themselves. So this type of injury, I, I think you told me a couple of years ago, this is the, the prevalent injury that used to end with the horses being euthanized, uh, the, the, the fetlock injury like this. It, it, what, what, am I right about that? Is, that? is it the vast majority of fatalities involves this particular injury or it used to? Absolutely, yeah. And in, in, in a lot of places, uh, this is the leading cause of, of fatalities. It, it, when you talk about musculoskeletal injuries, it's, it's catastrophic disruption of the suspensory apparatus. So this is, a, this is, I mean, this surgery really can be a game changer then in terms of, of not having to, to euthanize horses that, that suffer this injury. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it definitely gives a horses the opportunity to have um, a chance at life. And um, do you see it progressing further from, you know, where it is today as far as, you know, even better prognosis going ahead? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, if you look at uh, the approach that we've taken in California over the last four years to this injury, um, I think what you've seen is is better case selection. Um, I think we've learned a tremendous amount from our patients. Um, you know, you, you learn a lot from your successes, but in a lot of cases, you learn far more from your failures. And I think what we're able to do is, is fine tune a, a technique um, figure out when you need to incorporate the pastern uh, with the plate that we used in Echo's case or when you don't, um, to really understand these, these kind of minute details of this injury, because it's extremely complex, to give better outcomes to horses, you know, all across the country and, and really all across the world. And so there's been a tremendous learning curve that is going to result in a dissemination of information across the country and world from the cases that we've um, learned from here. And I think really the one of the most exciting things that I've seen is before we've done these and had long enough um, follow up, we really only thought this was a, a broodmare valuable horse procedure. We're going to save her for breeding and the best she can be is 
um, a mare with a foal on her side. But I mean, if you came to San Anita right now, there's a pony on the track that tra- that pony's horses back and forth the track every day that had a fetlock arthrodesis a couple of years ago. Hmm. And I've got videos of these horses jogging on the track and riding, doing things far more than I ever thought that they could do. And so that's really the exciting thing is to, to see that these horses aren't a burden. Um, they are they are productive and they really you know once you get them over the the initial you know four to six months they don't live on butte all day every day um they're they're stable they're happy they're they live productive lives um and the the fact that you know a, a horse ponied horses to the races in del mar that had a fetlock arthrodesis is nobody would have thought that was possible and so it's cool that we're seeing that kind of stuff because i think it's making people stop and pause you know and there, a, a wise man always told me you remember your first one your last one and your worst one and if that was all the same case 20 years ago then you're not going to be very excited about this procedure but if you if you see what we have accomplished now then you're going to stop and go well maybe it's not as bad as i thought it was maybe we ought to give this horse a shot and so that's the mind shift that we've seen that's been pretty exciting well that's fantastic we really appreciate you taking the time we hope uh echo zula progresses uh, the way she has uh, since surgery and and does have that uh, full by her side over the, yeah, in the well, coming years so well, her fingers crossed and say our prayers well thanks dr carper really appreciate you joining us this week on the friday show and uh, thanks to woodbine for their support of the friday show we will see you next week Support award-winning independent horse industry journalism and become a Pollock Report insider on Patreon. For as little as $5 a month, insiders get access to exclusive Q&As with Pollock Report staff, insight behind our editorial process, exclusive opinions and on-site analysis, Pollock Report merch, and more. This is not a paywall. The website you know and love will always be the same. But if you want more and you want to make our coverage even better, Visit patreon.com slash Pollock Report and become a Pollock Report insider today.